Okay, with that, we'll move into the last session under the legal side, uh, legal side session that we're working on. Up next is Ingalls Tejeda. He is a partner at Holland and Hart, a national firm with over 200 attorneys who specialize in natural resources and environmental law. Ingalls is a trial attorney focusing in bankruptcy litigation, distressed assets, acquisitions, and commercial disputes. For over 15 years, he has advised companies in the energy and technology sectors and has served as outside general counsel and relationship partner to a range of clients, including traditional lenders, investment funds, and family offices. Please welcome Ingalls. Well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yeah. All right, I'm a trial attorney. I can't stay still, so I'm going to try to move around. I'll try to also manage the um, the screen here, um, and we'll try to get all done within 30 minutes. We'll also try to cover all of bankruptcy law within that space. So quite a bit of things to do. Um, earlier, though, someone mentioned that they, there was it's dangerous for a um, I think he said a scientist to try to do law. I think he may have said a geologist. And he said it's as dangerous to have a geologist explain law as it is to have a geologist, uh, or excuse me, a lawyer explain geology. I think he was wrong about that on one part. It's probably 10 times as dangerous to have a lawyer try to explain geology than the other way around. Um, so I'm going to try to stay away from the geology part except for um, there are a few areas where we'll talk not so much about the geology but about um, environmental regulation and the impact on bankruptcies. But the core of the presentation is really a primer on the uh, bankruptcy laws of the United States, which I find fascinating, uh, both as a practitioner, but also as a foreign-born lawyer. I was born in the Caribbean, where the kind of stuff that we can do here, we can't do. Um, with that said, I am an attorney, a bankruptcy attorney, uh, a trial attorney who specialized in bankruptcy matters at Holland and Hart. Um, because I'm a trial attorney, this comes with a huge disclaimer. We'll start there. Uh, feel free to read it. I never read the disclaimers either, so don't mind if you don't. Um, but in a nutshell, what we're covering today, it's not, uh, you get it. It's, it's basically my opinion about uh, where the law is, but please do not sue us if you go and take some action and it turns out that the judge disagreed. Um, right, so bankruptcy. Um, the bankruptcy law is about uh, second chances. It is a remarkable uh, system in, within uh, market economies where companies and individuals who perhaps had a great business idea or in our case, uh, natural resources to exploit, perhaps they didn't have the right business model. And so they need a second chance to do what they propose to do. It also offers a second chance for companies or individuals who made a bet on that initial business, right? So those are the creditors, all the people who loaned money or who are otherwise affected by this business failure. So sometimes the bankruptcy is not started by the business, but by creditors uh, in what we call involunt involuntary bankruptcies. The general objectives are to give the honest but unfortunate debtor a second chance. We try to preserve the value of the bankruptcy estate, that is, of all the property of the bankruptcy, within the uh, while this reorganization is taking place. And uh, we try to do all of this in one single form, which is the bankruptcy court. So one huge um, benefit from my perspective and from the perspective of most uh, parties is of bankruptcy is that it's all uh, practiced in front of specialized courts. So these are judges who all they do is bankruptcy. And therefore, we tend to get more unanimity across the country uh, than in some other areas of law, like, for example, environmental law. 
That said, um, the appellate process does take us ultimately to the same jurisdictions that you are used to seeing. So the circuit courts in this area, we hear a lot about the Ninth Circuit, um, huge circuit and uh, with quite a bit of diverse of, uh, opinions. And so you end up getting some inconsistencies there. And then ultimately those get resolved at the national level at the Supreme Court. But by and large, it's one of the areas of law where we have more consistency because the judges are specialized. They're also known for being probably the most um, uh, specialized courts in commercial matters globally. Um, the goal is to promote or the, the uh, final outcome that we want is to achieve equitable treatment of similarly situated creditors. That is, we want people who made the same bet on this business to be treated equally. If they required a higher um, protection, for example, if they require a security interest in order to uh, loan money into this business, we want to make sure that they are treated with like people versus, for example, someone who didn't require a security interest but demanded a higher return up front. then we're gonna treat those people differently as well. All right, um, sources of law. So, Bankruptcy lawyers love this. Uh, we, uh, the framers contemplated that this was necessary. So we're one of the few federal um, commercial issues that are uh, codified in the Constitution. The ma majority of the um, source of the law for bankruptcy comes from the Bankruptcy Code, which is found in Title 11 of the United States Code. Uh, it is supplemented by federal rules of civil proce bankruptcy procedure, state law, and federal regulations, which is important for your sector. Right. Um, we won't go through every single chapter of the Bankruptcy Code, but uh, the first three uh, highlighted here, Chapter 1, 3, and 5, no idea why we keep skipping the even numbers. really don't know, um, but we did. So <laughs> Chapter 1 has all the definitions that they apply to every, every provision of the code. Um, two, 3 and 5 deal with the administrative matters, and they generally apply to every case or every, uh, whether a case is in their Chapter 7 or 11. Those two I've highlighted because those are the types of bankruptcies that you're most likely to run into. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what the implications of that are is in a minute. Um, chapter 15, I've put an asterisk, asterisk on because uh, for mines, the, the outsized influence that Canada has in this sector comes through quite a bit. And so you end up dealing with cross-border uh, reorganizations often there too. Uh, but generally, we'll be looking at Chapter 7 and Chapter 11. What is the difference? Chapter 7 is a liquidation. Usually happens when a business is decided that it's shutting down. Um, for your intents and purposes, this usually comes about when the natural resources are gone. There's no more, um, or there's no... I learned earlier today that perhaps when a mine is done, it's not quite done, so let's not say that it's over. Well, how will we say this? Um, a chapter seven is more likely to arise when the perspective of de developing the resource right now is not there, right? So there is no present uh, intention to, to proceed or no economically viable way to go forward right now. Chapter 11 is where you're more likely to see a reorganization. And the big upshot here uh, is that one, while in bankruptcy, the debtor is going to continue to operate the resources. So you're going to be seeing the same people that you were seeing before the filing. That's one. The second is that at the end of the day, we're going to end up with a going concern with a business that is continuing to operate. What we're gonna to try to do in chapter seven is get rid of as much liability as we can or as many liabilities as we can, um, and then emerge uh, new. So chapter seven or five uh, is a, a um, sub-chapter of 11. It's basically a expedited way to do chapter 11 for small businesses. One of the most important things that I can um, that I that I can hope you walk away with today is the concept of the automatic stay. Um, why? Because it could get you in a lot of trouble if you don't abide by it. Um, it is 
crucial for the bankruptcy process. And what it does and what it means is that upon the filing of a bankruptcy, we impose an automatic stay on any actions against the debtor, meaning the party that filed bankruptcy. There is a huge caveat for this. Um, it is codified under Section 362, and um, you know it, it bars any adverse actions. So if you are collecting against the debtor, you're stopped. I know that there are a lot of regulators here, but there are also many of you who are from the private sector, from um, companies that, that work in this space. Um, for non-regulators, the state takes an outsized role because it literally means anything. You can't contact, don't reach, don't email, don't call, don't ask, where is my invoice? You have to stop all collection actions upon the filing of the bankruptcy. Then you get a chance to go through their lawyers and ask for um, for whatever else, whatever you need and to participate in the case. But a very, very important part of the bankruptcy case is to stop um, any actions you have. And if, if even if you're a regulator and you're in doubt, you should err on the side of caution and not do anything that you're about to do. In fact, many bankruptcies are filed precisely for this purpose because the debtor needs you to stop doing whatever you're doing. Um, usually, they are trying to prevent you from taking away some major asset that they need or some some uh, equipment that they need. Um, but there's a huge exception in the environmental um, uh, world for um, governmental units. Uh, and essentially, what Congress did is that excluded from the automatic stay uh, actions taken by governmental units to enforce their regulatory or police powers. Now, most of the litigation in bankruptcies and bankruptcies involving mines evolve about or involve or revolve, excuse me, around whether an action by an agency falls within this exception. Is the agency taking an action uh, pursuant to its police and regulatory powers or to further those? Or is it is an agency trying to recover some financial compensation from the debtor, which is actually stayed? We'll talk a little bit more about that um, throughout the conversation. But remember that um, this is a big, big um, exception. So what does it cover? Well, some examples of that um, I've listed here, but courts have come up with a couple of tests. Um, one of the tests looks at the pecuniary purpose. Is the agency really, um, is this action that the agency is, is taking in furtherance of its pecuniary purpose, in furtherance of receiving some money or um, liquidating some money, collecting some money, versus um, is the agency looking at in, uh, preventing some action from going forward, some contamination, continuous contamination. The latter is not prohibited, it's not state, the former is. Public policy test uh, is a different way to get to the same question uh, or outcome, and in Using that test, what courts ask is whether the action or the, the act that the agency is trying to take um, is in furtherance of a public policy or is it a private right of action. So, for example, if an agency is suing a vendor for failing to deliver, I don't know, um, whatever tools the agencies need, um, then that would probably be uh, not a public, that would not be a public policy interest and uh, would be state. The state typically does not apply under either test to determinations or to proceedings to determine penalties, um, the amounts of natural resource damages, the allocation of liability uh, to PRPs under CERCLA, but the state does apply to enforcement of any of those, um, the outcome of those of those proceedings. So, in other words, the state will bar the attempt to collect on any of those amounts um, while the case is pending. All right. So we file the case. We state everything. There's a breathing space for the debtor and um, all the creditors are probably upset um, because whatever you were doing, you were, you've been stopped. Um, let's talk 
very quickly about the parties involved. We talked a little bit about the debtor. That's the entity that files bankruptcy. We call them a debtor in possession in Chapter 11. Um, that is distinguishable from a trustee uh, who is usually the person who takes over uh, the operations of the business in a Chapter 7 case. You can also have a trustee in a Chapter 11 case if you end up uh, with a debtor in possession who cannot continue to operate the, the mine for whatever reason. Uh, you usually see trustees appointed in Chapter 11s that are brought by creditors in voluntary Chapter 11 cases. Um, but generally, the debtor in possession or the debtor uh, files bankruptcy under Chapter 11 and retains possession of the case and is now responsible for administering, administrating the business pursuant to the rules of the bankruptcy code. We have the judges that I mentioned earlier. We have, a, again, our bankruptcy judges. Uh, there are 93, 96 uh, districts in the United States. Um, all specialized courts, they serve for terms of 14 years and typically only serve one term, um, but usually uh, come from the uh, private sector uh, before they join the, the, um, the bench. And then again, the appellate process follows the typical appeal process. There are a few circuits that have a specialized appellate court uh, called the bankruptcy appellate panel. Um, if you end up in an unfortunate situation where you have to appeal a bankruptcy case, I, we typically prefer that panel because, again, it's a, a entity that is very familiar with the um, bankruptcy space and commercial law. Uh, the United States, the Office of the United States Trustees is the federal agency responsible for overseeing trustees. Uh, for regulators, a great resource. They tend to work with the Department of Justice. So if you are in a situation where you have some questions about uh, whether a particular action uh, can be discharged, we'll talk about what that means, that might be a good resource for you or a good place to start. But really, it's more mostly an administrative agency just overseeing and make sh making sure uh, that the system is working as possible. Creditors, <laughs> you are here there because if you are not a debtor, if you didn't file bankruptcy, but you have you're affecting in any way by the bankruptcy process, you're a creditor. So a creditor is anyone who has a right or interest against any asset of the state or against the debtor. And um, and so most likely to know when, we're, when you're reading through uh, the literature and you see anything about creditors should do this or, or not, then it probably applies to you if you're in the entity that filed. Creditors can be grouped into committees of unsecured creditors um, or other committees whose uh, representation is covered by the benefit or the property of the state or from the, the process of the states. And then, of course, there are my colleagues uh, and investment bankers. Um, the general obligation of a debtor in bankruptcy is to follow the same rules um, as anyone outside of bankruptcy. So importantly for you, um, a mine that files bankruptcy still needs to comply with environmental laws going forward, natural resources laws going forward. Um, won't spend too much time on that, but just know that that's a, a core uh, argument. So filing bankruptcy doesn't allow you to stop complying with bankruptcy going forward, or excuse me, with um, regula regulations. In your, that apply to your business while you're in bankruptcy. But um, as we'll cover in just a few seconds here, it does mean that violations that happen before the filing date, that demarcation line, those may be able to discharge. A few really important things that I want you, you know, second thing that I want you to take away, if anything, from this is deadlines. Really, really important that you stick to deadlines because we're trying to solve a usually a typically a fairly difficult situation we're trying to do that fast so judges the bankruptcy judges will stick to the deadlines um, and it's one of the few uh, civil uh, litigation forum where um, we are fairly inflexible with most deadlines patents tend to do that too uh, but but this is um, these courts are, are fairly fairly uh, sticklers on their calendars they want you to follow the deadlines and an important deadlines for governmental uh, agencies is the 180 days uh, deadline to file 
proofs of claims. The proof of claim is how a creditor tells the court, this is what I'm owed. It's a very simple form, only three pages, but it's detrimental. If you don't file it on time, your claim, your claim gets kicked out, it doesn't get paid. Um, the, if you do end up in bankruptcy, and the debtor you know, needs to, to get out. There are a few ways that you can do so. One of them is to confirm a plan of reorganization. You need to follow the absolute priority rule. Back to that original um, objective of trying to treat creditors, similarly situated creditors equally. What the absolute, absolute priority rule says is that we cannot pay a claim that is in tier, say, three before we pay a claim that is in tier one. How do we classify the claims? It depends on what were the rights of the parties going into bankruptcy. A secure creditor, typically a bank, for example, that think of it as a mortgage, a, a bank that took as a mortgage interest on your home, for example, or on, on real property, that would be a top tier creditor, right? So that we're going to pay them up to the value of their security, up to the value of the land or asset that was securing that um, resource. For private uh, parties who invest in um, mining operations, you might um, pay a secure creditor up to the value of their um, NSRs or, or whatever um, other security you may have taken in the, in the resource. Then come uh, administrative expenses, so the expense of operating the bankruptcy case. During the months that the bankruptcy case is pending, whatever expenses were incurred during that time need to be paid. And those may include environmental costs. So if someone is having to um, comply with environmental uh, um, or regulatory uh, uh, principles while they are operating, or they may need to pay in order to clean up um, some, uh, clean up a, a site while they're operating, those may be paid uh, as administrative expenses. The last group, or second second to last actually, are general unsecured creditors. You didn't take any security, you invested into this, then you are probably there. That's also typically where all claims for pre uh, bankruptcy filing contamination fall. It's under the general unsecured claim category. And then there's equity. So owners of the debtors go last. And it's a waterfall. So until the first, the part at the top is paid in full, the next part doesn't get anything. And then that one gets paid in full. And then the next one gets paid pro rata. All right. Um, and you can also convert to Chapter 7. Uh, one important thing about this, because we see it often, you file bankruptcy to sell the property free and clear of all those pre-petition claims, right? And you can typically do that. It's one of the reasons that most businesses file. There is one big caveat on this for your purposes, which is you cannot get rid of CERCLA um, liability for current operators. Uh, you might be able to get rid of liability if um, either the you negotiate a deal to do so, so you can take the, the uh, business out free and clear, um, or a couple of other very unique exceptions apply. But generally, you even if you buy, you know, you buy the asset out of bankruptcy, you're still going to have to comply uh, with circling its face liability. Um, and then the last couple of things here that I wanted to highlight are that again you spend quite a bit of your time arguing about whether what you are seeking compensation for is a pre-bankruptcy damage award um, or is it a, a penalty that arose pre-bankruptcy or for post-bankruptcy um, act activity or is it injunctive relief um, typically Injunctive relief is not going to be discharged, so you're going to still have to comply with um, orders saying you need to do X, Y, Z to continue to operate. The key uh, question that the court will ask, though, is, is this designed to prevent ongoing contamination? or is it designed to punish you for prior contamination? If it is designed, if whatever you know, the, the action or the damage uh, is it's meant to punish you or remi remediate for pre-bankruptcy contamination, discharge. It's not going to be an enforceable post-bankruptcy. But if what you're trying to do is to prevent ongoing contamination or future contamination, that's going to survive bankruptcy. Um, there is 
but a okay so what do we do how do we prevent um or how do we protect ourselves pre-bankruptcy and um, there are a few things you can do first is um make sure that you're monitoring what this what the the company the potential bankruptcy debtor is doing and a few things to look for is inability to pay debts uh, the balance sheets are becoming insolvent um, there is a scarcity of credit typically a change in the market um, that might tip you off um, whether there are liens coming through um, specific to to this group i think one really important thing that you can do is to make sure that there is environmental compliance during the good times because um, the bankruptcy is come as me the minute that there is no way to um, get any more money out of the, the resource. People tend to file bankruptcy and then no one wants to stick around to clean up. Um, evaluate uh, relative rights in bankruptcy. And then at the bottom, we have a couple of um, things that are happening right now that, you, that, you, that might trigger some filings. Uh, natural resource damages always anytime you have a big award in that, in that area. Or um, as many of you probably know, there is quite a bit of activity right now going on with PFOAs and PFOSs, which my environmental partners tell me is a big deal and I've already forgotten what they stand for, but I know that you guys do, right? So that's coming up. I heard that it's everywhere <laughs> um, and we're probably going to see some, da some damage that works related to that all right how was that we are done with some questions i think we have like 30 seconds for questions you're good we're good for that was questions. perfect all yes right. any questions for angles now remember the rule bankruptcy is whatever all you'll do i won't know anything about geology so <laughs> Appreciate that uh, presentation, Eagles. Um, you had a note in there about reclamation bonds uh, at one point, um, and I want to go back, take that back mm -hmm. to uh, one of the one of your uh, first slides where you talked about um, automatic stays, yeah. with the exception of um, cool. some government units. Um, I, I'm engaging in uh, reclamation bond. Um, calculations and, and establishment and the question comes up occasionally can the um, it can state or federal agency requiring uh, financial assurance reclamation bond um, exercise the use of any of the assets to um, to do their work under that reclamation bond does does that exemption allow them to utilize any of those assets um, that the company has on site yeah, it's a great question. The answer should be yes. Is it? Depends. It depends on the judge, right? Um, the good news on this is that most judges are very attuned to this. It's not an issue that they are strangers to. Most judges aren't. Um, and so they'll be able to respond quickly. So this goes back to the basic rule, which is when in doubt, right, go to the judge. And the great thing about these judges is that you can literally call your attorneys can call chambers today and say we have an urgent issue we need a decision by tomorrow and they'll get on the phone with you and they'll call all the the partner or the uh, parties and have them on, on hand to make a decision if it's really truly urgent right otherwise you can get an answer within 20 days 30 days 15 days um, they move quickly the question uh, that you would ask is can i you know you would say I am not this. I am free to pursue my third party because the state does not apply to third party sureties. So I can go to my surety for this. But you would say to the judge, if the state applies, I want relief from it so that I can proceed. And the courts typically allow this, again, so long as what we're talking about is certain urgent. urgent. Um, if you are doing reclamation, uh, it depends how urgent the issue is, right? Is it going to be that it's going to uh, add too much to the project? Is that the urgency? Or is there some activity that was going to happen tomorrow, and now we are in doubt as to whether or not we, it can happen tomorrow, right? Um, so, but, but ultimately, it's a court that responds well to urgency. Uh, and so the strategic advice is make sure that you articulate your demand or your request in a way that conveys 
urgency for it, right? So think carefully about why do I need this and why do I need access to it right now? But generally, the whole point of a bond is that you have extra security in case that the data fails to perform. So it shouldn't be affected by the bankruptcy. Any one more question? Any questions? Great, I covered it all. So. All right, great. Thank, Thank you, Singles. Singles.